It's the 1980s, a time when we thought that digital watches were cool. Well, I'm glad that's no longer a thing. But more importantly from our point of view, schools have started to get and teach computers for the first time, and Acorn's BBC Micro dominates the school market here in the UK. In 1981, Acorn won the contract to supply a machine that would be used for the BBC's new show, The Computer Programme, which would be the core of a government-backed national computer literacy project. If you're interested in this story, I'd check out the BBC's wonderful drama, Micro Men. While schools and local education authorities were free to choose whichever computer they wanted, most chose the BBC Micro due to its levels of support and educational material, which soon of course became a virtuous circle. As more schools got them, they produced more educational material, which of course encouraged more schools to buy them, which made more material and, you know, virtuous circle. The BBC was also well suited to the school environment, what with its rugged construction and all. I mean, this thing could take a bit of a battering. It could survive an encounter with a sherbet fueled six-year-old. There were two models of BBC available at launch. The Model A that had 16K and the Model B with 32K. The BBC Model B made up the vast bulk of the sales, and shortly after launch was available for £399. The £399 price tag, though, didn't include a floppy disk drive, so software was loaded from tape. Tape would have its problems in the school classroom, however. OK, children. Now the software's loaded. I want you to enter your names into the software. No, 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 don't turn them off! Oh! Mother was right, I should have become an accountant. In a classroom setting, loading software off tape took a significant percentage of the lesson time. But schools could buy a disk drive and turn 20 minutes of loading into a few seconds. Problem solved, right? Well, obviously not, otherwise this would be a really short video. Disk drives at the time were expensive. I mean, the drive and the controller hardware you had to add to a BBC to make it work would set you around about 400 quid, which is effectively doubling the cost of a BBC. This was far from being a unique problem for the BBC. Most 8-bit micros of this era didn't ship with a floppy drive either, and in fact used tape. For this reason, at the time, disk sharing systems were not that uncommon a thing, and you could often spot them in businesses and colleges. As the name would imply, a disk sharing system allows computers to share a disk, and it relied on the fact that not every machine would try and access the disk at the same time. There are a number of disk sharing solutions for CPM at the time, and it's the reason Commodore has a somewhat unique and crazy system for handling floppy disks, where the drive is more or less a full computer with CPU and RAM, and the PET or C64 etc connects to it via serial so it can have the world's slowest floppy experience. This is where the concept of Econet really appealed to schools, as it would allow them to share a disk drive. Oh, finally we got onto the topic of this video. However, Reconnect was far more than just a simple disk sharing system, it was a true LAN technology. Yes, it would allow you to share out a drive, but it would also allow you to pass any data from any station in the network to any other station. This was a fairly unique solution for handling this at the time. Econet as a product already existed prior to the launch of the BBC Micro, and Acon had put it in most of their existing machines like the System 2 and the Atom. So, when it came time to lay out the PCB for the BBC Micro, Acorn included the Econet design there on the main board, the idea being that you could buy a kit of electronics off them and simply add the components later on and solder them yourself. I mean, simple, right? I mean, who doesn't want to do that? To hear about how Econet came about, let's hear from one of the co-founders of Acorn, Herman Hauser. The breakthroughs, and there were lots of them. Acorn was very, a very, very innovative company. You tell, well, me, tell me about some of them. Yeah, lots of these breakthroughs were actually made in the Italian kitchen, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a, a few doors down. When we had dinner, well, one of them was the Econet. Hmm. So one evening we went out there to the Italian kitchens and invented networking. We, you know, we thought we had, um, we had computers, they really ought to talk to each other, and we got terribly excited about linking them all up in a, in a local area network. Hmm. And we designed this network. And Andy walks in. I said, Andy, Andy, come over here, we, we've got this network, and, and, and here it is. We had it on, a, on the proverbial serviette, and Andy took one look at it and said, total rubbish. <laughs> now work. The way you need to do this is <laughs> like this. And, and it was this, uh, 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 this uh, change that Andy produced to uh, a very simple, um, uh, uh, what basically was an Ethernet type uh, uh, arrangement that then led to the most successful 
local area network in Britain at the time. We had 10,000 installed econets in British schools before most people knew how to spell Ethernet. One outstanding part of getting Econet working with the BBC, Acorn left to later was the software. While they had a working filing system ROM for their other machines, some work would be needed to get it working with the BBC. Also, some server software would be needed so a BBC could serve files from its floppy disk to other machines. This work was to be carried out by Acorn's Australian distributor, Barson Computers, as they needed Econet for a tender for the Tasmanian Department of Education. Barson won the tender, and thus the BBC was approved for use in schools by all state and territory education authorities in Australia and New Zealand, where it did pretty well in private schools, but then lost out to the microB in state-run schools. With Econet now ported from System 2 to the BBC, Acorn launched it in the UK in 1984, which would be its most successful market. As mentioned earlier, Econet was more than just a simple disk sharing system, it was a general purpose network. Yes, disk and then later file and print sharing was its primary use, however any BBC could send and receive data from any other station on the network, and it had a built-in station-to-station -station messaging system, which you could use to amuse your classmates or really annoy teachers. It could also do remote screen viewing and capture, and also remote control. There were also chat and email applications, and a whole bunch of other apps were developed for Econet during its lifetime. And of course there was an X25 gateway, which you could use to connect to remote networks or even to a mainframe. At the electrical signalling layer, Econet is basically RS-422. Now, our clued up Apple II fans will be thinking, ooh, Apple Talk used RS-422 as well. And if you're thinking that, you're right. If you're thinking, so, BBC Network can talk to a network of Apples? Uh, well, then I'm afraid you'd be wrong. How they use RS-422 is actually pretty different. Econet was based around the Motorola HDLC, uh, MC68B54. Yeah, because I just remember chip numbers. And Apple's implementation was based around some Z80 based thing. Sorry, Apple II people, if you thought that was a little dismissive. This video is kind of about Econet and, and not the Apple. I know if you want a video on local talk, uh, you know, say something in the comment section below. There we go. Econet used five wires for its physical signalling. One pair was for the data, one pair for clock, and the final single wire was used for a common ground, with all models of BBC using a 5-pin DIN for joining the computers and the network. So, physically, an Econet network would consist of a number of socket boxes mounted on the wall, with one shielded twisted pair cable linking them all together, with a terminator connected at each end. If you're thinking, well, that's a bit dramatic, you're probably picturing the wrong kind of terminator, and not something designed to stop electrical signals reflecting at the end of the cable. There were two types of Terminator, Acorn's powered active Terminator and the much simpler passive type, which is just 250 ohm resistors soldered across the data and clock lines, like the plug you can see here. Acorn also did a version of the passive Terminator which was just an Econet socket box with just one less port. The maximum length of a single Econet network was a whopping 500 metres, or at least according to the install guide it was, which may sound very long compared to the 95 metres for say a 1 gig Ethernet over copper, but this network did have to snake its way around a whole school. And remember, the network consists of just one great big long cable. It's not a hub design like modern Ethernet. The final bit of equipment you needed was a clock box. The clock box can be plugged anywhere in the network, but Acorn recommended that you did it near the centre of the cabling. The clock box generated a clock signal on the network that all stations must synchronise the reading and writing of bits to. The clock makes the electronics for every station on the network a lot simpler, as a station either reads or writes a bit whenever there's a clock pulse. So no clever synchronisation techniques needed on each workstation, like the preamble in Ethernet for example. I should also mention Acorn did ship a small Econet kit consisting of T-pieces, rather than the wall-mounted boxes you've seen before. This kit shipped with the file store unit, however it was only really suitable for small networks of a few stations, as it was fairly easy to pull out one cable and break the whole network. Acorn produced an Econet interface for every single one of its 8-bit micros. Whereas the BBC integrated Econet's design onto its main circuit board, later models of BBC like the Master and the Master Compact had a small daughter board you could simply add to the main board. Acorn also reused this Econet board in their Archimedes line of ARM-based machines. They also kept developing Econet add-on interfaces all the way up to their RISC PC and released an Econet module for that system. There was also available an Econet card for the IBM PC, 
To be honest, that was not that successful because one, it was as expensive as all hell. And two, it was the most complicated design imaginable as it even had a 6502 processor right there on the card. Both the Econet ISA card for the PC and the Econet module for the RISC PC are pretty hard to get hold of these days if you wanted to get yourself one. In Ethernet, whenever you want to send a frame onto the network, you just broadcast that packet. And the same is true of pretty much every Ethernet derived technology like Wi Fi, etc. But in the world of Econet, things are a little bit different. Econet uses something known as the four way handshake. The first part of the handshake is the transmitting station sends something called a scout frame out. If the station it wants to talk to is available on the network, that station will then reply to that scout frame. The sending station then sends out the data packet it actually wants to transmit, and finally, the receiving station acknowledges that packet. Although this uses more bandwidth than the Ethernet approach, in a world of lossy networks, this system works very reliably. Right, so now the moment you've all been waiting for, let's have a look at a little bit of kit. First up, we have the Level 1 file server. The Level 1 file server is your basic disk sharing solution. Basically just a regular BBC with a floppy disk controller and a floppy drive running a little bit of server software. Now this is pretty basic, there's no usernames, there's no passwords, you just connect to it and you can read what's on the disk, that's basically it. It's a disk sharing solution. Next up, you won't be surprised to discover we have the Level 2 file server. This is actually a pretty big step up from the level one. This is no longer just your primitive disk sharing system. Now this is actually a proper file server by now. We've got usernames, we've got passwords, we've even got a hierarchical directory structure and you know, different access rights on them. Now to run this extra more enhanced software, the BBC needed the second processor adding to it. So we just pop an extra 6502 on the side. It holds 64K of memory. But we are all still floppy disk based at this point. And now we have the level 3 file server. I'm guessing some of you have spotted the naming convention here. Now this is pretty darn similar to the level 2, only now we have the addition of a hard drive. Now the hard drive means we can deal with a lot more users accessing files at once, because the hard drive's got a much higher throughput than the floppy disk has. We also have way more storage as well. Now Acorn did eventually introduce the level 4 file server, which I've not got here, but it's basically any Archimedes machine running the level 4 file server software. And given how powerful the ARM CPU was, yeah, it pretty much outperformed everything that went before it. Acorn also introduced their file store. Now the file store is pretty much a level 3 file server, only instead of being a separate discrete BBC, second processor, hard drive, what you've actually got is the BBC and the second processor and the Econet interface all into one box, with a SCSI interface, in the case of this version, and then a separate SCSI hard drive unit, or two SCSI hard drive units, three, so on and so forth. There was also a non-SCSI version of the file store as well, so why this is called the E1 OS from SCSI, now it's just called the E01. So far we've only explicitly covered Acorn's products, but there was actually another vendor in the Econet space, SJ Research. Now some of the kit you've seen so far is actually SJ Research stuff, so the clock box, uh, the wall socket box I showed you, they were all made by SJ Research. Now SJ Research went on to make their own version of the file store, the MDFS. There are plenty who probably think of the MDFS as the best file server from this era. Now, instead of being based around a 6502 like all of Acorn stuff, the MDFS was based around a Z80. It could utilize standard BBC floppy drives, but also use SCSI to drive all its hard disks. Its SCSI support was a bit more flexible than that of the file store, in that you could also add tape drives to the MDFS to perform backups. The MDFS also offered a feature known as Fast Mode, where one workstation could get priority and move data much more quickly between itself and the MDFS. So what happened to Econet after its brief period in the sun? At one time one of the UK's most prolific networking technologies, as time went on it found itself being displaced by the somewhat more common Ethernet technology that became popular in PCs. However, it did keep going into the late 80s and early 90s as it could be utilised by the Archimedes range of machines. And later on, Acorn created an encapsulation technology for Econet known as AUN, Acorn Universal Networking, which allowed all the Econet protocol to run over Ethernet. Support for AUN and also Econet hardware made its way into the Linux kernel as well, and in fact was only removed from the 3.5 kernel in 2012. 
Well, thank you for sticking with us all the way to the end of the video. I know this one's been quite a long one. If you enjoyed it, I'd ask that you press the like button beneath. And if you hated it, feel free to hit dislike or destroy my soul in the comment section below. Alternatively, you could use the comments in a positive way and tell us about your experiences with Ekinet. I would also like to thank Professor Alan McFarlane for his kind permission to use excerpts from his interview with Herman Hauser. And of course, as ever, if you like this video, please feel free to subscribe, as your support makes quite a big difference to small channels like these.